Okay, we'll get started slowly. I know people are still tuning in. Welcome to the Apalachicola and National Estuarine Research Reserves Sci Cafe Series. Today we have Rob Meyer and he's with the Tall Timbers Research Station and he's going to be talking to us about burning butterfly questions, the elfin in the room. So um, the series, uh, the Sci Cafe Series is a platform to share information about science that's been conducted in the Apalachicola Bay and area in an informal, casual setting, bringing together residents and scientists to explore topics. Our program will be about an hour in length, and then we'll have time for questions. Um, if you have a question, you can type it in the question bar, and Kennedy will, um, Kennedy's our tech person today, and he will ask your question to Rob. Um, or raise your hand. Uh, as I mentioned, we have Rob Meyer. He is a research scientist at Tall Timbers Research Station. He's originally from New York, but after graduating Sunny College and uh, Sunny College Environmental and Science Forestry, he quickly made his way south and worked in Mississippi and Kentucky, Kentucky on species such as the cotton rat, bobwhite quail, and the red cuckaded woodpecker. After graduating Mississippi State University with his master's degree, he started working at Tall Timbers as their woodpecker conservation specialist, where he helps maintain the red cockaded woodpecker on private lands. He and the Stoddard Bird Lab are dedicated to preserving more than just birds, and they preserve all sorts of animals that are endemic to the Red Hills region from rails to snakes, even butterflies. His work on the frosted elvins began three years ago and has developed into several key research projects aimed at understanding the relationship between the fire and to help conserve the Apalachicola National Forest long-term. Mm -hmm. Rob, take it away. Hey. Well, hi everybody, and thank you for that uh, introduction, Anita. Uh, I feel like I always have to justify myself in why I'm studying butterflies when I'm the uh, woodpecker conservation specialist for tall timbers. But in truth, they are uh, just an interesting species and they're a pine endemic species that needs fire and really fits the bill for tall timbers pretty well. Uh, so I began working on them a couple of years ago and I haven't stopped yet. So let's hope that keeps going. Uh, so I called this the elfin in the room, not only because I like puns, but uh, they kind of, this butterfly is an example of a species that is pretty secretive and it's right in front of us and it's been in front of us the entire time. And in fact, this species was only discovered in the Apalachicola National Forest about a decade ago. It had been there a lot longer, but it just went unnoticed for that long of a time. And the uh, other reason I call it the elf in the room is because it's a species that needs a particular kind of fire and has a certain relationship with fire that's really important. And it can really explain a lot about how fire was kind of naturally in this area and what it means for us going forward because the trends in prescribed fire are not necessarily beneficial to elephants and what they need. But first, I want to tell you about what the frosted elephant is. So I'm betting a lot of people uh, have never seen this species and they are a pretty secretive one and they'd be hard to pick out in a crowd. So they're members of the uh, Lysinidae family, which all the members of this family of butterflies are all very small. And this guy's no exception. He's about one inch in wingspan. Uh, they uh, live in these kind of fire dominated sand hill areas and definitely the Apalachicola Natural Forest is a great place to find them. And they need sand hills, which can also include uh, the sand dune areas of like the Great Lakes region. They stretch up that far and they used to be in Canada as well. So the, the common denominator there is sandy soils. And as far as we know, they need two, one of two host plants, uh, either wild indigo, which is a kind of a shrubby plant, or the sundial lupin. Sundial lupin is uh, all we'll be talking about today because that's the only one that we have here in the Apalachicola National Forest. Um, uh, it's a very small plant and it's the only one they have, so can't really talk about one without talking about the other as well. But first, uh, this little critter up in the top right is the frosted elfin. Uh, the, there's a couple of things to look for in identifying the frosted elfin because they have a similar species called the Henry's elfin that looks pretty similar. They don't occur in the same kind of habitat, but the habitats can be adjacent and they can be confusing. So the frosted elephant gets its name for that frosted hind wing margin, but there's two other things to look for as well. And that's this uh, broken line in the forewing 
uh, of the of them there. You can see it's kind of like this uh, black bordered with white, and that disjunct uh, look about it is uh, specific to elephants. And this little black dot that's in that uh, frosted margin as well can tell you that that's an elephant. But you want to use a couple different features because scales can rub off on these guys over time. So having multiple arrows in your quiver for identifying this guy is definitely very useful out there. And they are uh, sexually dimorphic. So males and females do look different, but the way they look different is on the uh, inside of their wings that they usually keep closed. So you're probably not gonna be able to tell if that's a male or female you're looking at. But uh, if you do manage to see them open up, the males have scent pouches on the leading edge of their uh, forewings. And the females are kind of this overall orangey look and don't have those scent pouches. But they are pretty charismatic little guy and been pretty fun to study too. So, like I said, we can't talk about elephants without talking about their host plant. And so for butterflies, the host plant is the thing that they need to complete their life cycle and usually refers to the ones that they need for their eggs and caterpillars to, uh, to eat and grow on. And so the sundial lupin, like the elephant, is very small. It's about a one foot tall plant. It's very easy to overlook, but once you're looking at it, it is very unique in appearance. Uh, it, like other lupins, uh, has that kind of uh, palmate structure about its leaves and call the sundial because they actually move with the sun as well. They kind of orient themselves with that. And this plant is a, uh, it's got a beautiful blue flower uh, that it springs up in, uh, that springs up in the spring. And the plant itself is also kind of secretive in that it's only above ground for half of the year. Uh, the other half of the year is below ground and trying to save its stores uh, until next year. Because if you're a one foot tall plant, you're not gonna be very competitive for sunlight space. And so once everything greens up in the summer, these guys go below ground, uh, save their energy. And then in the spring, they come up before anybody else, grab that sunlight real quick, and then go back down below ground. And the other interesting thing about this plant is that it has very large taproot, like other sandhill species do, because they're trying to tap into the water that's uh, way below the soil surface. They also form these uh, colony kind of groups where the, uh, the, there's actually a rhizome for this lupin that travels parallel to the ground surface and then they pop up with these little shoots that you see here on the right hand side and so they kind of form these clumps these aggregates of uh, lupin patches I'll be calling them from now on and it's kind of a clone species because any one of those individual plants there could actually be tied together via that rhizome and so when we talk about individuals it's usually just ramets but it can actually be the same thing or the same one and those rhizomal systems can be many feet long. They can be eight feet or more. We're actually not sure how long those things can get, but that is their primary way of getting around the landscape is by slow vegetative propagation, creeping along the ground, maybe one yard in a year. And so uh, when this plant uh, gets uh, overshaded by other things and dies out, if the nearest sundial lupin is maybe 500 yards away, it'll take roughly 500 years for that plant to get back to that same spot because their growth is so slow. So once they're gone, they're gone. And that's been uh, one of the reasons these guys have been declining. The uh, Sundial Lupin is not as bad off as the elephants, but the elephants are certainly missing that habitat component via their host plants and a few other factors that have been hurting them as well. So currently, range-wide, uh, the frosted elephants occur all the way from uh, Texas to here to Florida, which is kind of their southern extent of the range, and then all the way up to New York and Wisconsin. And like I said, they previously were also in Canada, but have been extirpated from that state as well as several other states. And I don't know why, but for some reason, they do not like Mississippi. Uh, <laughs> another mystery to solve another day. Uh, so all these green dots are records of frosted elephants. Uh, so they're not necessarily, they do exist there, but we know that they existed there once upon a time or still do. And so it could be that there was a museum specimen that had a frosted elephant in there and it was from Tennessee. And that's why there's that one little dot over there by Memphis. Uh, that's what this is looking at. And in that red uh, circle area up, up to the north, uh, that's kind of the range of the Carner Blue butterfly. And that might be something uh, you guys have heard of. It's been endangered for a little while now. And it's also another Lysinid, another small blue butterfly that happens to overlap uh, these guys in their range up there. So the elephant is getting uh, some conservation via the Carter Blues as well. And Carter Blues also use the same host plant for their, uh, for their life cycle. So sundial lupin is good for all, it seems. But for most of the states, uh, they are either endangered or threatened, uh, the frosted elephant that is. Uh, so 
of the 400 known locations, all those dots you just saw, uh, 300 of those we know almost nothing about. We know that they were there, but we don't know what the current state of them is at all. Are there, is there one left? Are there, is there a booming population? Is there Hope's plant even there anymore? We don't know. Nobody's bothered to look uh, pretty much. And there's been an effort this year by Fish and Wildlife Service to kind of do a range-wide survey to try to fix that. Uh, this is from the Fish and Wildlife's uh, status assessment that was done in 2018. And so 300, we don't know much of anything about. The other ones that we know something about, most of those are considered a uh, low or moderate condition or just extirpated entirely. And uh, low to moderate, uh, their conditions for that is uh, you don't find a whole lot of elephants within a day. So if you go through their habitat, you may find about five individuals. That'll be about the maximum number you see in a day. Uh, so those are pretty low populations and there's only one uh, high uh, condition population and that is the Apalachicola National Forest. And uh, at least for the southeast, the reason they're endangered and threatened in uh, the, these states uh, is because of the lack of prescribed fire and habitat destruction. So the, uh, the longleaf pine ecosystem, uh, the 9 million acres of, or 90 million acres that that once had, is now reduced to about 5% of that range. So overall, the habitat that they would have been in is diminished. And then of that habitat, now if we don't burn that enough, we're losing the host plants and that is losing our elephants as well. Up north, there could be a bunch of other reasons as well, including pesticides and just general overshadowing from uh, hardwood encroachment. Uh, like I said, there's only one good population and that's in our backyard. And once I, once I found that out, it's like, we got to be doing some research on these guys because we actually have the population numbers to get good estimates uh, via science uh, on these guys. And elephants need a whole lot of work done in order to investigate things that they need. How many of them are there? How far do they go? What is the relationship with fire? A whole lot of questions to ask about these guys. So uh, we jumped on that ability or that uh, offer right there. So to back it up, uh, why do these guys matter? Um, it's a common question of anything that gets conservation needs is why, what is its relevance to me or to the environment? Um, these guys are a pine specialist, a uh, sand hill specialist, so they kind of serve as an umbrella species, just like the red cockaded woodpecker is. It is a flagship kind of for this habitat type. So if you protect the frosted elephant and its habitat, you essentially protect uh, everything else that also occurs in that kind of habitat. And these guys have a very sensitive relationship with their habitat. So if you protect these guys, pretty good chance everything else is going to be benefiting as well that used to live here. Uh, also, the reason why we care is because it might be considered uh, for uh, a candidate, it's a candidate species for the Endangered Species Act, with a decision to be made probably by about 2024-2025. So one reason we care is maybe we get some funding out of that to help uh, with some more research on these guys, but also it has a lot of re legal ramifications. Uh, for us going forward. And if they're going to be uh, federally endangered, we need to know something about these guys uh, to keep them around. Uh, as far as uh, being a butterfly, uh, pollination is usually one of the things that butterflies are good for. These guys, not really so much. They, they most likely do, but the, uh, the lupin itself, uh, they probably don't do a whole lot of pollination there either because the lupin, uh, the shape of that flower is more conducive to a bee getting in there to actually open up the flower to pollinate it versus uh, an open flower like a daisy that's just sitting there for the butterflies to go onto and then jump off. But uh, they probably do a little bit of pollination with uh, other species that are around at that time uh, that these guys are flying, which would be like uh, your blueberries and other things on the forest floor. But overall, probably not much pollination going on. Uh, they can, however, be a good food resource and not much is known about this, but uh, with other lacinids, other members of this family, uh, they, each female can have up to 200 eggs. And so imagine just a dispersal of 200 eggs per female. Now, maybe some of those hatch out and become caterpillars. That's an awful lot of food uh, for other wildlife species. Uh, primarily, it's going to be other arthropods. So uh, maybe praying mantis every once in a while, wasps, uh, spiders, a whole lot of those things eating them, and then it comes, kind of comes up the food chain from there. And so there's a good relationship here with um, the sundial lupin, which is a legume. So it's a member of the Fabaceae family, it's a bean. Those are usually big nitrogen fixers. And so there's this thing that's grabbing up some nitrogen, making that available. These caterpillars are eating that. Now they have that nitrogen and other things are eating them. And so it's actually making nitrogen a little bit more uh, bioavailable in this system and kind of a trickle down effect from there. 
a little bit more needs to be investigated about that, but uh, probably doing some good for the overall community there. And the last part is kind of like wildlife viewing. Uh, so just like you have birds and birders, there are butterflies and butter butterfly errs out there. And uh, it's a pretty big draw to say you're the best population in the known universe for frosted elephants. This is the only chance to see them, it's right here. So uh, you don't have to go wandering for days and try to find one or two. You can go here and stumble upon uh, dozens uh, potentially in a day. That's a pretty big draw for people. Uh, over here on the right is another curious uh, thing that <laughs> I liked a lot. Uh, there is actually a, the first butterfly beer ever made was on the Frosted Elfin. There's a brewery out of first magnitude uh, out of Gainesville that uh, took a swab to one of these elfins and collected the yeast that's on them. And there's naturally occurring yeast on pretty much everything. And so they grabbed the elfin's special variety of yeast and uh, brewed a beer based on that. And it's a pretty good pale ale. Uh, I don't know if they're still making it, but uh, it got released about two years ago and they might still have a couple of cans around. So keep on the lookout for that. So bear with me as I take you through a year in the life of a frosted elfin. We kind of have to show you what it looks like to be an elfin for the year in order to understand its relationship to fire uh, and what the elfin needs going forward. So if we start in January here on this little wheel of time, uh, we have the uh, sundial lupin just starting to pop up above ground. So like I said, they're only above ground for half of the year. They get outcompeted in the summer for that kind of uh, sunlight space. So they pop below ground and then they pop up in January. And so in January, you're going to have uh, some young shoots coming up. And then come March and April, you're going to start seeing some flowers uh, for the front, uh, for the lupin around that time. Fast forward another month, and you have the emergence of the frosted elephants. And so the adults come out. Uh, males usually come out first, awaiting the females to arrive. They find these areas of lupin. They hunker down, start patrolling those areas. And then when the females come out, they meet up with them, mate, and then go off to lay eggs on the lupin, uh, either the leaves or the buds of the lupin flower. And so they first start showing up in February and you have one big kind of peak in March and then they start tapering out towards April. So an individual elfin might live about 15, maybe 20 days, but it's likely they live a lot shorter lifespans than that. So there's only one flight a year and that's in starting in February with a peak in March. They go out and they lay a bunch of eggs and these are what the eggs look like. So imagine a one inch wingspan butterfly. Now imagine how big their eggs are. It's about a millimeter long. And so they prefer to lay their eggs in the young buds of the flowers of the sundial lupin. And, we th and they probably do that for two reasons. Uh, one is because the uh, flowers themselves have a little bit more nutrition than other parts of the, uh, the sundial lupin. So, uh, if you think about a leaf, that's really fibrous, not a whole lot of nutrition, but if you're going after the flower parts, that's gonna have a little bit more uh, protein in it for you. Now, uh, the other reason is because if you're a one millimeter wide egg and you have a one millimeter long caterpillar coming out of there, imagine the mouth parts that are on that caterpillar. They're not gonna be very big or very strong. And so they're going after the young flowers because going through a petal is a little bit easier than going through a leaf. And so they're munching on the softer parts of the flower uh, relative to the whole thing. So it's not only more nutritious, but it's also what they can actually eat. So tucked in there are a whole bunch of eggs and they hatch out into caterpillars. And so this is what they look like. Uh, they look a little different than caterpillars of other uh, butterflies and moths. Uh, they look like little green slugs. They're pretty, they're pretty charming in their own way. Uh, and photo number 15 here, uh, that is kind of like a mid, uh, uh, midlife uh, larva right there, midlife caterpillar. And then they become a bigger one in number 18 there. When they're young, uh, we call it first instars for insects, uh, they eat the flower bits. Then when they get a little bit older, they shed and then become a little bit larger. And so it's called instars when they keep shedding, growing a little bit more each time. They have about four of those that they go through. And each time they eat a slightly different food. So after the flowers are eaten, uh, in stars two and three go after the leaves and they do this window painting it's called where they eat the underside of the leaf and leave the top side of the leaf relatively alone uh, then they move on to whole leaves at a certain point to the whole rest of the flower so they can eat the stem uh, the whole 
stalk of that little flower bit down to the ground if they wanted to. But usually they just eat the, the leaves part. And so there's a couple months where you'll see caterpillars out there and around the same time you'll have the peak flowering for the sundial lupin. And it's a pretty big show out there and they're gorgeous flowers. They make for a great uh, garden plant. Then uh, the once the flowers are done, they form these little bean pods. Like I said, they're a legume. So they form these little pods and uh, the pods have the seeds in them. Once they dry up, they turn black and then they kind of burst open and fling the seeds out in uh, any direction. Maybe they're lucky to make a make it a couple feet away from the, the host plant or the plant patch there. And those little dots you see on those uh, bean pods, that's actually from the uh, the frosted elfins. They kind of chew on the bean pods as well. They'll, they're little monsters, they'll eat everything. Then they go off the pupate. And then as you can see on this wheel here, they spend the majority of their time as a pupa. So about eight, nine months of their life, they are this little stagnant bean in the ground somewhere. And they can pupate under foliage at the soil surface or below the surface as well. And so we come to this idea of fire, a prescribed fire. So what time of the year should we apply fire for the frosted elephant? Uh, the, like any animal, you don't burn the animal because the animal wants to be burned. You burn the habitat to promote the animal's habitat. And so the elephant could care less if there was fire, but we need fire to maintain the system here. So what time we apply it, we want to be careful that we don't hurt the uh, the butterflies, but we do promote the habitat with this thing. And so when looking at this, we can burn during the flight season for the adults in February, maybe January. Uh, the butterflies themselves can leave the premises and come back after the fire. And in fact, we've seen them do that. Uh, they We burn the habitat, they fly away, they come back, and they've even landed on the same perches as before. Uh, so they sit on a little uh, oak sapling and look for females again. But if we did that, there'd be no lupin. Uh, so we just burned all their host plant. They have nowhere to lay eggs. The caterpillars have nowhere to feed. So we don't want to burn during the adult flight season, nor do we want to burn the eggs or the caterpillars. The eggs don't move much uh, at all. And the uh, caterpillars, they move at the speed of a caterpillar. So they can't exactly escape fire or protect themselves. So when you burn during those parts of the year, you're likely to just cause full wholesale mortality. So that kind of leaves us with the pupa. So this guy also can't really avoid a fire either, but where they decide to pupate might save them from fire. So when kind of coming about this question at first, we have to think about, okay, we need to know where these guys are pupating. They can go anywhere. They when you think about like a monarch caterpillar and where it wants to pupate, it kind of form these chrysalises that uh, kind of dangle off of vegetation somewhere. These guys don't exactly do that. They, they don't have a stalk like that. They just kind of find somewhere to pupate underneath. And so let's say we want to know where this guy is pupating. Well, we can watch him and watch him walk away to wherever he's going to pupate to, but I don't have that kind of time. And this guy moves at the speed of a snail. So not exactly a high octane action. And as well, uh, when they're going off to go pupate somewhere, uh, they actually uh, might make a make a pit stop. They'll stop there for a day, and maybe they're assessing the situation, and then they move again. And so they kind of form these kind of jittery motions where, for the most part, they're going very slow or not at all, and then they make very large movements in the span of an hour or so. And then you can easily lose this thing if you're coming back once a day to try to find out where he is. You're likely to lose him. So how we've solved this issue is uh, with UV fluorescent powder. And so uh, this powder, if we powder this guy up a little bit, they'll leave little breadcrumbs for us. And so if we put powder on the caterpillar, it'll go across the landscape, rubbing up against this leaf, that uh, pine, this whatever, and we can follow that to wherever he pupates to. Because if he's pupating below ground, we won't be able to see that. And in fact, we have a needle in a haystack uh, to the extreme if we're trying to find a pupa somewhere in the soil around you. This helps us do that. And this powder is actually uh, shown safe uh, for caterpillars. It's actually been used on monarchs uh, caterpillars before as well on some studies there. And this is what it looks like. Uh, this is why I wanted to do this uh, presentation in October as well. And kind of got glow in the dark uh, caterpillars out in our woods. So pretty interesting. The uh, image here is two caterpillars, one that doesn't have any powder on them, which is one on the right, and the one that does on the left. The ones on the right also kind of pop out under UV light at night. Uh, their bodies are a little bit reflected to that, but they still don't stand out a whole lot. Once you powder them up, they are 
eyesores and they're very easy to see. And so if we're checking on these guys, hey, did you pupate yet? Uh, we can go back, we can come in at night and see, hey, well, there you are. And maybe if we can't find them, we can follow their trail. And so here's an example of a lupin rabbit at night. And you can see on the left-hand side is a, uh, a lupin leaf that he ate a couple of those uh, petioles, but he didn't eat all of them. You can see a little bit of powder on there from where he, where he was. Then he went down towards the stalk and maybe spent a little time up here, went down, looked at some other things, and you can see a little bit of powder on the ground. So we'd come in, we'd see that and say, oh, we're good. he's gone. Where is he going? Is he just trying to find another lupin to eat or is he going to go pupate? And then hopefully we'll see a little pink butt somewhere. And that informs us of where he's gone to pupate. And for some reason, this one decided this bit of sand was good enough. And he started going straight in. Uh, and that's where he pupated about half a centimeter below the soil uh, right there. And that's how we know anything about where they want to pupate. But because these guys are going below ground or have the potential to go below ground, that makes it so that way this guy has a chance of surviving a fire. Because fire, heat rises. Uh, now, if you have soil surface, a lot of your heat's going upwards. Not a whole lot's going down. You definitely have a lot of heat radiation percolating into the soil, but sand is also a very poor conductor of heat. And so uh, once you're about a couple of inches below the soil surface, you can't even detect that a fire went across the soil at all. It, you feel nothing. So knowing that these guys are going below ground, there might be some hope for them. And so this is what it looks like uh, where they decide to pupate sometimes. If you took a snapshot of the ANF, this is... <laughs> what it looks like pretty much. Uh, you can't really see it in the middle of this photo uh, is a pupa. It just decided to go underneath some wire grass. And in another example, this one over here went under uh, a oak sapling and under one of the broad leaves that that oak had dropped the uh, the previous year. And so one went under some pine straw or some wire grass. The other one went under a broad leaf. If you know about uh, fires and fuel, uh, pine straw and wire grass are really good conductors of heat. They'll carry that fire very well. Broad leaves like oaks don't burn very well. Uh, they tend to hold a lot of moisture to the soil surface because they're so broad, they don't allow a lot of evaporation to occur uh, from underneath it. And so the one on the right kind of protects himself a little bit more by choosing that oak to be underneath because maybe that oak won't burn as well. And then the one on the left here, maybe he was hard up for a pupation spot and decided to go for that uh, wire grass clump he's likely to burn up uh, pretty hot when the fire comes by. And yet again, we had another uh, caterpillar uh, from this year. All these, a lot of this data is coming from this year of work. Um, we had another caterpillar that went under a pine cone. And pine cones, uh, they have a tendency to burn for half an hour to an hour after a fire has gone by. And that is not good news if you are if you decide to pupate under that thing. They actually cause, uh, pine cones are pretty interesting in preferred fires because they kind of form these mesocosms of sterilized soil. It burns so hot and for so long in that one little radius where that pine cone was that it just nukes, just sterilizes everything that was there, bacteria, plants, whatever it was, is just sterilized and gone. Uh, so if you pee under that, you're you're gonna have an issue. <laughs> so these guys are uh, dispersing themselves across the landscape and sometimes choosing something that's productive for them uh, to be overwintering or oversummering in. Uh, I'm sorry to say that this uh, video on the right side is not going to play. Um, it is a uh, burn video from one of our experimental plots. Uh, it just shows kind of blackness. But uh, when you have a fire, it's not like everything is burned at the same degree. Uh, fires are very hetero heterogeneous. There's Even if you had the same fuel type across that landscape, you have areas that burn more than others. And the difference of this, the fire got to 700 degrees right here. Uh, one foot away could be the fire got 300 degrees here. It could be wildly different. And so these guys are dispersing themselves across a landscape that is also very variable in how much heat gets applied. And so what we want to know for frosted elephants is sometimes the people might be able to protect themselves and maybe we can modify the fire and how it behaves based on how we burn the habitat. So we have a few options. Uh, we want to know uh, the heat tolerance of these pupa versus the uh, ignition pattern. And what I mean by ignition pattern is uh, when you're a uh, prescribed fire, uh, firefighter out there, you can lay down a line of fire and there's certain behaviors that you can promote. So if you're going with the wind, uh, you can make a head fire. It's going to be very hot and very fast because the wind is uh, feeding into the oxygen that the fire needs to burn. And it's going to burn very hot, but very quickly. It's going to move very fast. 
or they may choose to do a backing fire. So against the wind, the fire is going to move very slowly and not very hot because it's a uh, going to back into the headwind. So maybe if we want these uh, pupa to live, we want to do the backing fire because it's less heat, but it's going to hold the heat over them for a lot longer. So is it better to be a flash in the pan, really hot, but really fast, or is it better to do cooler fires, but slower fires? And so it's better to have that 20 second period of fire or that two second period of fire pretty much. And so far the data is shaping up to be, it's better to be hot and fast than low and slow. Uh, but we need a little bit more information and we're still analyzing the data there. We also wanna know what factors are contributing to burial depth. And so why do they choose what depth they do? Is it because of the compaction of the soil? Maybe these little guys can't really dig very well. They don't have digging uh, appendages to do so. And so they're just trying to wiggle their ways into the sand as much as possible. So maybe if you had a lot of tractor equipment go over this area once upon a time, they're not gonna be able to go as deep into the soil and that's gonna make them susceptible to fire regardless of what you do. Uh, and then also we wanna know what soil depth is safe. And luckily we have some work that I'll show you soon about that. So going back to this question again of when do we wanna apply fire in this life cycle of the frosted elephant, we pretty much have this area of pupation from May to December that we can burn in. And it's pretty much the time that we wanna do this. Any other time of the year, we're gonna be causing wholesale mortality, 100% mortality because these pupa uh, might be able to save themselves. And this is what it kind of looks like. Uh, this is some work from Matt Tom and Jared Daniels from UF uh, back in 2017 on a surrogate species. So this wasn't frosted elephants, but it shows a caterpillar that also has a burying habit down in South Florida. And the zeros you see on the X axis are uh, pupa that are just at the soil surface. And then there's some differing uh, soil depths from uh, uh, 1.3 down to five centimeters, just about. And on the y-axis is your chance of survival. So you see at about 1.5 centimeters below the soil, not very deep, you start to have this switch of everything's going to die if you're not that deep to, okay, you might have a chance of living to about 2.8 centimeters where, okay, if you're that deep, fire is not even affecting you anymore and you're safe. There's a weird thing in this data set too, uh, where 4.9, they tend to be going downhill. I wonder if at that point you just have so much soil above you, it's causing suffocation of the, uh, the pupa. But sorry for another day there. So let's say we do burn from May to December. What happens to that population afterwards? Because like I said, these pupa aren't going to all survive. And so if we were to imagine a data set here, and if we have adult numbers on the Y and just time in years on the X axis here, they kind of form this exponential growth up to the point where you burn the habitat, then they decrease, they have exponential growth, you burn, they decrease. And so they have this unique a relationship of fire where you're going to have a lot of them die off, but the following years afterwards, there's going to be a whole lot more survivorship. They're going to grow, reproduce, and then have another year growing reproduction. And all those pupa after that first year of fire are going to hopefully make it a little bit more so than the ones that are burned. So you have these ebb and flow. Uh, so it's not a constant uh, carrying capacity of frosted elephants over time. It's staggered and kind of janky. So keeping that in mind, you kind of want to have multiple burn units next to each other so that one can help seed the other. And this is what I'll show you here. So also this year, we did a capture mark recapture study on frosted elephant adults. So here we have two burn units. We have a south side and a north side at the AMF. And all these gray blobs are the lupin patches themselves. They kind of form these aggregates of individuals and they form these little dots across the landscape. So we, uh, for mark recapture, you capture them, you mark them with something to give them a unique identifier, and then you release them and find out where they go. And half the reason for doing this is to see what kind of population numbers we have at the AMF, but more so, we want to know dispersal patterns. Uh, how far do these adults go? Some other members of the Lysinidae family that are studied out in the Mediterranean Sea, those ones have a host plant that they don't go more than a foot away from. So they cover over this host plant, they try to find another one. If they don't find it within a foot, they turn back and go back to the host plant. We know these guys can travel a little bit further than a foot, but we don't know how far. So if it's only 50 meters that they tend to go, well, that matters a lot for your connectivity of your loop that you're gonna to have to have in order to support them long term. And so uh, down, anyway, down here on the south side is burned one year ago prior to us doing this study. And on top here, we have three years since a fire occurred. So a little bit hairier on top and a little bit more bare on bottom there. 
And this is what it looked like. Uh, we had modified a bug net, a uh, butterfly net, to catch these uh, adults. We had to chase them down first. It was kind of fun. Uh, we modified it so that way we can uh, have these little holes in the net and we can apply a gel pen to the butterfly's wing. And the gel pen gives us a unique identifier on that individual. So now when we release them, we know that we caught him here and now he went 20 meters this way. He went 500 meters this way. Uh, it's the only way that we'd ever know who is going where. Otherwise, it's just a cloud of butterflies all over the place. So this one, this individual will be red, silver, red, gold, gold. And so he was caught on the north side and we'll figure out where uh, he or she goes because we can also sex them. What we have in the hand. And so on the screen now are all the recaptures that we had uh, because I want to show you where they ended up moving to. Uh, the pink dots are for females, the blue dots are for males. And we overall, we caught about 450 butterflies. And 400 of those came from the top unit, the three years after a burn, we got 400 butterflies. From the one year after a burn, we got 50. So it's almost a tenfold difference in how many butterflies are there from a one year to a three year burn. Quite a difference. And this is where they ended up moving to. It's a whole lot of chaos, it looks like. But what was really promising about this is it tells us that they can they can cross over. So when you have a lot of mortality from fire in one burn unit, as long as the next burn unit over has not been burned, they can have individuals fly over and start laying eggs in that other burn unit. So you don't have to rely necessarily on people surviving. You can have units close by that can help seed it. And this is where we get the concept of a metapopulation from. Uh, these guys, uh, what metapopulation means is that the you have these cycles of islands throughout the environment, basically. And while one island might collapse, another island booms and might seed that one, while the last one might collapse again. And you have these growing, sinking sinks all over the place in this dynamic where they all rely on each other, but no one individual uh, kind of stands out by itself. If we were to zoom in on one of these, just to show you a little bit about their behavior, one of these looping complexes. Uh, you can see, uh, if you kind of squint your eyes a little bit, uh, look at the south side of this map and you'll see a lot of blue dots hanging around, just zigzagging all over the place. Meanwhile, all the pink dots are kind of going all around, just kind of diffusive overall, whereas the males are kind of congregated. These, uh, these butterflies that the curious habit of having these male mating territories where they tend to sit, patrol, and either fight other males or try to intercept females as they're trying to get in towards the loop and patch and to try to mate with them before they get in there. But pretty cool sexual uh, behavioral differences there. So zooming out again, we get the a sense of dispersal distances. And so on the right, this graphic, uh, don't have to pay too much attention to it, but it's basically saying that of the ones that we recaptured, the ones that we were able to see again, uh, so we only saw about 100 and, 150 of these guys again out of the 450 that we caught in total. Of those 150, 75% of those were able to make it about 250 meters. Uh, so that starts to give us a sense of, okay, 75% of individuals should be able to make it at least this far. Uh, then uh, we can set up, so if you have a large burn unit and you have a bunch of lupin within there, making sure that you have lupin in an adjacent unit about 250 to 500 meters away will ensure that at least sometimes you'll have individuals coming over from the other side feeding into that one that was just decimated by fire. So that way we can keep them perpetuating and going and feeding off each other. But before this, we didn't know what spatial orientation of Lupin to have at all. If it was enough or potentially what barriers there could be to movement. Some butterflies, uh, once you leave a habitat type, they panic and turn around. So if you had a, a road, are they willing to cross it or not? This also showed us that they're willing to cross minor barriers uh, to disperse across that. This one really far one, uh, our super girl we call her, she went about one and a half kilometers away, which is a pretty significant distance uh, to make. And she, like I said, these females might have 200 eggs and you have one girl that made it almost two kilometers away to lay her 200 somewhere across the line. And maybe she didn't make that straight line distance necessarily, but she was able to stagger her way over there and maybe dropped a whole bunch of eggs along the way. So that gives us a lot of hope that when we burn, we can rely on butterflies feeding into each other. And so what we've uh, kind of accumulated from all this work and from the work of others as well that have been working in the ANF is uh, bigger patches mean more elephants. 
So if you were to burn a lupin patch, and this is the case in some areas across the range, there's one site in Maryland, for example, that has sundial lupin, but only about the size of the footprint of the building you're sitting in. That's as much lupin as they have for miles. That's all they have. So when you burn something that on that scale, you're a little hesitant because you're decimating the entire population. You can't have another one that will help seed in that one. It becomes very precarious how you burn. But bigger patches gives you more elfins uh, just in general. More uh, There's more host plants to feed off of, more pupation that gets to happen, more adults the next year. So bigger patches are better than smaller ones. Uh, populations decrease dramatically after a burn. Uh, a lot of wholesale mortality, but a little bit better with the pupa than anything else. And your peak population size happens about three to four years. Uh, now, without uh, fire, these guys will just keep increasing until the carrying capacity of the lupin prevents them from eating any more than they can produce caterpillars for. Uh, there's a peak at about four to five uh, years, around three to five years, because at some point, after a burn, if you don't burn for so long, the vegetation starts creeping up higher and higher and starts shading out your lupin. And so it can only go on for so long because of the habitat's constraints. Uh, so three years is about the fire return interval that we would expect to see, three to four. And it also depends on what habitat you're burning in as well. And we know that spring burns hit harder than non-spring burns. And I put an asterisk next to this because we've only burned in spring once in the ANF. And that was actually a wildfire that occurred in, I think, 2017. And the lupin patches that burned during that spring burn, uh, they definitely did not have the same adult numbers as others within that same unit. And it took a long time in order to recover uh, numbers in there. So we know springs aren't very good burns for them. And we also know that pupa can sometimes save themselves. So that way, all this together, we know to burn somewhere from mid-May to December. Uh, potentially, you can burn in January as well. But if you burn the lupin too early, you might have adults come out and then have nothing to lay on. So maybe mid-January is about the, the uh, limit there. Mid-May to mid-January, we can burn it. So let's take a look at the ANF. Uh, this is a map from uh, uh, the Natural Areas Inventory. Uh, you can find this online anywhere. Uh, the, sorry, the scale is a little bit small, but basically the yellow is the Sandhills habitat. So we have a big clump of it right south of Tallahassee and then a little bit throughout, uh, maybe a little bit over in Bristol, there's a tiny bit near Sumatra. And uh, for the most part, the elephants are restricted here to Munson Hills. They have, there are other elephants outside the Munson Hills unit uh, that is called in the ANF, but for the most part, they're restricted just to this one area here. A lot of the other habitat, uh, you just wouldn't find lupin in. Uh, either it's too wet or uh, the conditions just aren't right for them. All the green there is uh, pine savanna, so potentially it could be in that green area as well. So ANF has the habitat for them. Uh, this is a, a map. This is a pretty cool thing too that you can find online. I'll left the URL there uh, for your interest. But there is a, a map developed in part by Tall Timbers as well called the Southeast Fire Map. And it has a rasterized uh, version of pixels over all parts of the landscape. And you can toggle the map and show you different things. This is the ANF and relative to when it was last burned via detection by satellite data. So the satellite looked at this landscape and said, does this look like it was burned within one to three years? And just keep in mind that this map is made about from, uh, was made in 2019 roughly. So it's not current or up to date, uh, but this is what it looks like overall. And we're looking for that uh, one to three year interval, that kind of rusty color there. If you look across the ANF, we got a pretty good amount of that one to three uh, burn, burn return interval. And then the, uh, the little less ideal uh, area is that kind of four to nine, that kind of orangish color. And the Munson Hills is primarily that orangish color. And it should be, because it includes that four, year four as well, uh, hopefully a lot of that in the Munson Hills is year four. And you can see a little bit of that wildfire that occurred in 2017 there in the Munson Hills. Uh, unit over there, that little bit of red right in the middle was the wildfire. So overall, that's looking pretty decent. But we also want to, it's not just enough to say that we burned in that interval. We also need to know that the season of burn was also relatively good for them. If we burned in the spring, then we're going to get some mortality. And if we burned in the spring and we didn't even know that they existed there, we're just wiping out the population little by little without even knowing. So this is data that was taken uh, roughly by uh, 1990 to 
2010. So the data is basically saying of all these burn units, when what time, um, what month was it last burned in? And so you have all these here relatively evenly distributed except for February. There was a lot of burning in February. Uh, and this is the time of the year that we do not want to burn for elephants uh, if, if we want them to survive in that burn unit. And that's about 47% uh, of all the burns landed in that period of time. That's not to say that happened in the Mudson Hills where we have the majority of the elephants, but across uh, wholesale ANF, that's where they ended up uh, burning. And so it's also kind of curious why burns end up here uh, in the first place, because naturally uh, before European settlement, when you had wildfires across the landscape, uh, they were mainly driven by lightning strikes, which would be in the lightning season, which is right after this period of time in June to August, roughly. And so why are we burning during a time that doesn't normally burn? Well, it's kind of hard to burn in summer nowadays. Uh, this is a, uh, a map that was made uh, from a study from uh, last year. There's a lot to look at here, but if you just want to look at the top row for now, uh, we have winter transition and summer seasons, and we the the color gradient here is the bright green is the we were able to burn any day during that time we wanted, and red is we can't burn at all during that time, and white is somewhere in between. So how many what percentage of the time could we actually have prescribed fire on the ground? Uh, and that means that the uh, the humidity was right, the wind speed was right, it wasn't too dry, it wasn't too wet, all those things combined. How does that look? Uh, by the definition that they have in this paper, winter and transition periods here, the first two maps, are times that we don't want to burn for elephants. But those times that we don't want to burn for elephants are really easy to burn. It's easy to get fire on the ground during those times. During the summer, when we want to burn for elephants, so in this column here, it's harder. It's about 50% of the time we can burn for elephants. And then this paper also went so far as to say, well, if climate change is to happen, the best case and worst case scenarios with this middle and bottom part respectively, uh, if we're projected to 2070, how easy will it be to burn in the summer? It's getting harder and harder because it's getting drier, it's getting more and more unpredictable. And we're, if the worst case scenario is correct, in the next 50 years, we might see hardly any fires at all happening during the summer. So all those fires that we're having in the ANF during a time where we don't want to burn for elephants are happening because that's when we can get fire on the ground now. Uh, during the summer, you're kind of just at the whim of nature. So if it rained, then you might have enough water on the ground, enough moisture that if you burn two days from now, it might not be so hot that you won't kill the overstory pines that you have. Because hot fires will do that. They'll top kill your pines and maybe your regeneration of pines. And that's also no good. So it's very precarious. A uh, window of time in the summer. That's why a lot of them don't happen in the summer anymore, even though naturally that would have happened. So let's summarize this a little bit. Uh, what the elephants need, uh, from what we know for now, uh, we, we need a lot of host plant patches so that way they can have this meta population dynamic where one can feed into the other if the other collapses during fire. And prefer preferably the larger the patch, the better. Uh, and hopefully you have patches outside of burn units that are within about 200 to 500 meters so that way they can seed each other. If you only have one burn unit, it's gonna be pretty tough to keep those guys going long term. And hopefully you have burn and umber next to each other. And you burn during the May to December period. Also what we kind of want to know still and uh, what we can do more work in in the future uh, is our patchy burns better. Uh, so maybe we could just burn anytime as long as you leave some unburned. So you let a fire go through the habitat in winter, but some of the fire doesn't actually burn everything. There's a little patch of unburned habitat within everything that was burned. Maybe that can protect your elephants. And we also need to know still what factors compute, uh, contribute to burial depth. So what is forcing that little guy to go underneath that pine cone versus into the soil at this, uh, this deep versus this deep? Uh, knowing that, we can help maintain the environment to help promote them to go underground. And eventually what our ultimate goal is, is to get a population viability analysis to put all of these metrics into one model and say with this kind of colonization rate, with this population size, with this kind of productivity of your adult females and how many caterpillars survive, this is what the population will look like over the long term. Uh, we eventually want to get the, all those metrics into place, get all the variability that's involved in that and predict out into the future are these guys safe for the next 100 years? Are they safe for the next five years? We want to get that eventually. And 
that's Elfins in a Nutshell. I just want to thank our uh, two sponsors here, the Fish and Wildlife Foundation of Florida and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for funding all this fun stuff we got to do for this year. And with that, I'll take any questions. Okay, thank you, Rob. That was that was really amazing. Um, do we have any questions? You raise their hand or? It looks all clear from here, but we can give them a second to see if they're typing anything. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I guess in the for the future too, there's a lot of different research projects we want to do, including uh, how to translocate these guys as well. And we're trying to develop methods on that. So if you used to have elephants and maybe you have good lupin habitat, how do you get elephants back to your landscape? Is it as simple as just throwing out one female to lay your 200 eggs? Or is it better to release caterpillars onto your landscape and have them pupate wherever they wanted to and emerge whenever they deem fit the next year to start being productive themselves? It's also a big field that we're starting to work in now and hopefully start getting more of them out into the landscape and giving the Fish and Wildlife Service a, a way to get these guys back out there. Yeah. Amazing little creature for sure. Yeah. <laughs> They're very charming. Uh, they So go out there in mid-March and uh, try to find some lupin patches. And these guys have a wonderful little behavior about them where they, they guard their territories, the male mating territories. And they just sit there and wait. And when another elephant comes by, they kind of do the spiraling flight, go up into the sky, disappear above the canopy, and then he comes back and sits there again and starts looking again. And we don't know if they're just sniffing each other when they're doing that. So a male's trying to assess, hey, are you a, are you a threat? Are you a mate? What are you? Uh, we don't know what that is about yet or how often they fight or how successful they are in battles and who wins battles. But <laughs> yeah, they're pretty, pretty fun to watch. They're energetic little things. We've got one question in from Dave McElveen. Uh, how long does an individual caterpillar live? Caterpillar, uh, hmm. I guess I never, I never thought of that in that context as a, how long does a caterpillar live? I guess you can have a caterpillar, uh, how long is that stage? Uh, because it'll hopefully it keeps living and becomes a pupa. Uh, the caterpillar, I believe it'll be about a week per instar. And so it might be about four weeks that you have a caterpillar from egg hatch to starting to go pupate. And also, uh, just another general thing to note too, all that, that whole wheel of life there, imagine rotating that slowly as you go northward as well. As you start like losing the growing degree days, it'll start having to shift your lupin and your elephants around that period of time too. But it should be roughly the same for all that time or for that whole range there. Also, this is another just fun note that we uh, we got to realize this year. During COVID, we had to do uh, a lot of work in our own homes, and we were raising some of these uh, little caterpillars into. Uh, and uh, it occurred to me that the pupa actually make noises. As I was just in my house, I heard this clicking noise. And it turns out these guys, as a pupa, can actually make a noise. And it's not uncommon for lysinids to do that. Uh, other species do it as well, but it's unknown why they're doing that. And some believe that it's uh, to mimic the sounds of ants. So ants might hear that clicking and mistake it for one of their own uh, young. And so they grab that guy and pull him below ground. And so that way they protect themselves from fire, getting the ants to drag them below ground for themselves. And then they hang out down there until they emerge as adults and come out the ant mound. We're not sure if these guys do that at all, but they have that kind of ability. So it might be an evolutionary relic from their close ancestor, or maybe they do have some ant that takes care of them down here. We don't know, but they do make little sounds as pupa. They're pretty charming. Okay. I don't see any more questions. Um, Lynn, ha Lynn has submitted a question if she raised her hand. Kennedy, can you see that? Yeah, one just popped up from Lynn. Do you see any indication that the population is moving north due to climate change, perhaps? It could, but I, I guess I'd worry about the um, uh, the lupin being able to move north fast enough. So the, yeah, the lupin could only move one meter a year, one yard. It, it can't really like go across. And once you have a Walmart in the way, it's not going to make it past that either. 
the uh, the butterflies can move, and being at the southern extent of the range here at the ANF, we're the best population right now, but it's probably not going to hold forever. It'll probably get too hot uh, for not too long. Hopefully, they do move north, but they've been extirpated from Canada, and I'm not sure if their host plants are expanding in Canada to help with that northward movement. Uh, and there's just too many, they're just too few and far between at the moment to really say there's been movement. It's more like isolated populations are hanging on. They're not able to move at all because they're so restricted to their host plants. So I guess short answer, I don't know, but I, I don't think they can make it if they if they had a choice. I don't think they have enough time to do it. Okay, well, thank you so much, Rob. That was, yeah. that was wonderful. Um, we uh, really appreciate you, your time and, and your the knowledge you've, you've given us. Um, I also wanted to thank Kennedy, Kennedy Hansen, for being our tech help today and helping with questions. And just to let you know, our next Sci Cafe will be November 18th at 3 p.m. John Brucker will be, he is the manager of the Apalachicola Aquatic Preserve. And he will be giving an update on uh, some oyster bars that were um, put in place by, I believe, FWC. And uh, we have been doing the monitoring on them for the last few years. So he'll give an update on the status of those bars and how they look. So please join us that day. And uh, thank you all very much for coming. And thanks again, Rob. Thank you.